Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. Do you have periskid vidcatriophobia? Periskid vidcatriophobia is a fear of Friday the 13th. Today, millions of people are on edge, fearing a calamity with personal or global repercussions, a broken leg, a stock market crash, or the trigger pulled for World War III. To be fair, some bad things in history did happen on Friday the 13th. The World War II bombing of Buckingham Palace took place on Friday the 13th, 1940. Rapper Tupac Shakur died on Friday, September 13, 1996. But some good things happened as well. The famous Hollywood sign was unveiled on Friday, July 13, 1923, and the accordion was patented on Friday, January 13, 1854. Okay, maybe the accordion thing is actually bad, not good, but that's beside the point. The question is, why does Friday the 13th scare us so much? I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… A father locked his kids in a trailer while going out to get drunk, but the supernatural makes him pay for it. A non-believer in the supernatural is forced to rethink his beliefs when he almost dies of fright. Not all monsters in the closet are imaginary as one parent found out. Most stories of people being abducted by aliens or being experimented on by extraterrestrials are often chalked up to something like sleep paralysis. But what if the aliens leave behind scars on your body that cannot be explained? And later, what's the deal with Friday the 13th? When did it begin? Is there anything to it? Is there anything we can do about it? Why does Friday the 13th scare us so much. But first, we head to 1897 Boston, where a young woman is found dead, strangled, and the only eyewitness is a blind man. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to win our contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness. The strangulation of Alice Brown in her room at 15 Corning Street in Boston's South End dominated the front page of the city's daily newspapers in the autumn of 1897. It was a sensational crime, which seemed custom-made for the yellow journalism of the era, with a mysterious victim, a colorful cast of witnesses, no clear suspect but several possibilities. The Globe, the Herald, the Post, the Journal, and other Boston dailies aggressively followed clues and gathered background, hoping to scoop each other and the police in their vivid reporting of the crime. In the end, they may have been too aggressive, adding more confusion than clarity. Alice Brown, age 25, was found dead in her room by another resident of the lodging house the morning of November 4, 1897. The medical examiner performed an autopsy on the body and quickly determined that Brown had been strangled. There were seven finger marks on her throat, including cuts made by fingernails. 
the police brought in three residents of the house for questioning. Edward Hurd, the proprietor of the house, and two men who shared a basement room, John T. Stowell and Thomas Hughes. They were examined and released. Very little was known about Alice Brown, who had moved to the lodging house just two weeks before, and the search for her identity would become nearly as frantic as the search for her killer. Alice was known to keep late hours and was seen in the company of several different men. She had an ardent lover of over 60 years old who visited night after night pleading with her to marry him. She always refused. Around 11.30 the night of the murder, she was seen sitting on the front steps with another man who no one recognized. They spoke in earnest tones for about half an hour before the man left. The person who seemed to know her best at 15 Corning Street was William Levitt, a blind man known as Blind Billy, who sold song sheets on the street at Tremont Row. Levitt told police that he had been awake smoking in his room above Alice Brown's around 3 a.m. the morning of the murder. His door was ajar and he could hear Alice in the hallway talking to a man whose voice he did not recognize. It was a long conversation. The man was trying to persuade Alice to marry him. Levitt heard her say, no, I wouldn't marry the best man that ever lived. He asked again and she emphatically said no. Well, I suppose I might as well go then, he said. Yes, Alice replied. Levitt said he knew Alice's lover and said he was not the man she was talking to. It was believed that Alice was murdered sometime between 3 and 6 a.m. A magazine found in Alice Brown's room had the name Alice O'Brien scribbled on the cover. Alice O'Brien had previously lodged at 15 Corning. When she was located at her new address, she said that Brown was somewhat reticent about her past but had told her that she grew up in a small town near Concord, New Hampshire. Her mother had died when she was 15, and within a year she ran away, leaving the farm for the city, where she hoped for a career on the stage. In Boston, she had been visited by lovers from her girlhood home. She had left New Hampshire with another girl, Hattie Belmont, who had been her childhood friend. Alice, a brunette, and Hattie, a blonde, were the bells of the town. Romantic novels gave them the notion to run away and they drifted between New York and Boston, working as shop girls but looking forward to a life on the stage. According to the Boston Globe, the rouge on their cheeks told only too plainly after a while what sort of life they were living. Alice Brown and Hattie Belmont had been roommates at 15 Corning until Alice received a message that Hattie had been arrested and charged with undue intimacy with a married man. None of this information proved useful to the police, though. They were unable to find Alice Brown's family in New Hampshire. Another resident of 15 Corning had seen letters postmarked Amherst, Massachusetts, addressed to Alice Brown and believed that was her home. Someone in Gloucester believed she had been in that city under the name Redmond and had been committed to an insane asylum. The night of the murder, two people living on Ohio Street across the backside of 15 Corning reported hearing a muffled scream between 4 and 5 a.m. One woman who lived at 15 Corning also heard a scream but no one else in the house did. The discrepancy made the police suspect that some of the residents were covering for the killer. There was no sign of forced entry, and the only way in the front door was with a latch key. Alice Brown's latch key was missing. The newspapers said the mystery was deeper than ever. On November 6th, a man from Lynn, Massachusetts, who was visiting Boston with his wife, reported that he had overheard a loud conversation on Tremont Row. He heard a blind song vendor say, she can't try that on me, she can't try that on me, I'll fix her. He was speaking with another man, whose description matched that of James McMillan, the 62-year-old suitor of Alice Brown. The police scoured the city for McMillan and found him in Haymarket Square 
at about 1.30 the next morning. McMillan was known to be an admirer of Alice Brown. In fact, it was said that his mad infatuation had caused her to leave her old residence and move to Corning Street with the hope that he would never find her again. McMillan lived on Tremont Street with a woman named Sadie Hart, an intimate friend of Alice Brown. McMillan told police that he and Hart had gone to Corning Street to call on Alice and ask her to join them for supper, but she was not there when they arrived. He said he had known Alice for about 10 years by the name of Redmond. Alice did stop at the house the night of the murder, but left before 10. Both McMillan and Levitt denied that the Tremont conversation ever happened. The same day, several other witnesses came forward and the newspapers printed all of their stories. A man claimed that he saw Alice Brown at about midnight on the night of the murder, dining with a man at a cafe, and she left with the man. At Corning Street, a strange man came with a message for Alice Dewey, room 3, The landlady, Mrs. Hurd, told him that there had been three Alices in the house, but none named Dewey, and the one living in room three was dead. He said he had a message from Harris Gladwin, a waiter at the Parker house, but when the stranger realized he was in the murder house, he left without giving any more information. The Parker house denied ever having an employee named Harris Gladwin. The former lover of Hattie Belmont, Alice Brown's most intimate friend said that Hattie's name was really Alice Ward, and the two Alices became friends when they were inmates of the same reformatory. Both were pretty girls, he said, but wayward. He believed they had left Boston for New Bedford, but police found no trace there of Hattie Belmont, Alice Ward, or Alice Brown. A man from Amherst, Massachusetts, came forward to say he believed the dead girl was his sister-in-law, Mary Redderham. She had lived in Amherst, but had been sent to a state reformatory. He would travel to Boston to identify the body. The Boston Globe discovered that the man who overheard the conversation on Tremont Row was not a visitor from Lynn, but was John Henry Carrison, a reporter for a rival newspaper. Police said they trusted him and agreed to withhold his identity, but they also said that their reasons for arresting McMillan had nothing to do with the alleged conversation. The following day, McMillan was released. Police investigations now focused on the unknown man who was seen leaving the South End restaurant with Alice Brown around midnight the night of the murder. The Boston Herald made the truest statement yet, quote, it is expected that developments today will go a long way toward clearing the mystery, or else it will be darker than ever." Unquote. What happened next surprised everybody. The police arrested blind Billy Levitt for the murder of Alice Brown. Jack Whalen, a resident of 15 Corning, came forward with another story of the night of the murder. His room was directly above that of Alice Brown and he could hear nearly everything that transpired in the room below, as well as on his own floor. He was awake that night, and at around three heard a noise coming from Levitt's room. He opened his door and looked out into the hallway and saw Levitt going down the stairs and through the hall toward Alice Brown's room. All was quiet. Then he heard the muffled scream of a woman. Immediately after, Whalen saw the blind man coming up the stairs and heading for his room. The police had been suspicious of Levitt right from the beginning. He was a little too eager to furnish them with information, and he seemed obsessed with the case, talking incessantly of it and continually furnishing them with new information. Some of his stories were contradictory. Alice O'Brien had said that Levitt was among the men who would not leave Alice Brown alone, he made bold statements and entered her room uninvited. After driving Levitt from her room, Alice Brown told Alice O'Brien that Levitt was a bad man. Levitt's record in New York and other cities bore this out. He had traveled extensively before coming to Boston and had served time at Blackwell Island for petty offenses. It was said 
that he was not as blind as he let on and had excellent hearing. Levitt consorted with thieves and fallen women, and it was reported that he had previously spied for the police or anyone who would pay him. The same day as Levitt's arrest, the body of Alice Brown was positively identified as Mary Alice Rutteran by Mrs. Lucy S. Brown of Cambridgeport, who had employed her as a domestic servant. When she had seen the name Mary Rutterham in the newspaper, she decided to see if the dead girl could possibly be her former servant. Mary had said a little about her past but told Mrs. Brown she had come from Ringe Center, New Hampshire, where she still had a brother living. Mrs. Brown remembered Mary as a pleasant, trustworthy girl, but the family's attitude toward her changed after they caught her smoking cigarettes in her room. She moved out soon after, and Mrs. Brown said she had stolen a gold watch when she left. She also took their last name when she moved into Corning Street. William Blind Billy Levitt took his arraignment as a joke. He declined counsel and waived examination, but was still intent on explaining the situation. I suppose I have to go through with it, he said. I might as well stand the pressure as anybody else. The statement is against me on account of the newspapers. He was still talking as he was led out of the courtroom. Pending the grand jury hearing, Levitt was held without bail. Seven fellow lodgers of 15 Corning Street, witnesses in the case, were also held on $500 bail which none of them could raise. Levitt was well represented when he appeared before the grand jury. His attorney stressed that he had no motive for killing Mary Alice Rutterin. While it was true that she repelled his advances, there was no evidence that he was strongly jealous. The marks on her neck were made by someone with long fingernails, and Levitt bit his to the quick. Most importantly, the only witness against him was Jack Whalen, whose nickname at 15 Corning was Happy Jack, because his mental force was said to be not of the strongest. The grand jury concluded that there was not enough evidence to indict William Levitt. No one else was ever charged with the murder of Mary Alice Rutteran, a.k.a. Alice Brown, and the case is sometimes cited even today as one of Boston's unsolved mysteries. Coming up on Weird Darkness, a non-believer in the supernatural is forced to rethink his beliefs when he almost dies of fright. Plus, most stories of people being abducted by aliens or being experimented on by extraterrestrials are often chalked up to something like sleep paralysis. But what if the aliens leave behind scars on your body that cannot be explained? And not all monsters in the closet are imaginary, as one parent found out. But first, a father locked his kids in a trailer while going out to get drunk, but the supernatural makes him pay for it. That story is up next. October is the anniversary of Weird Darkness, and we celebrate by raising funds to help people who suffer from depression. Chantel wrote in saying, I had fairly aggressive postpartum depression three years ago. I work as a reservist in the Canadian Armed Forces and full-time as a correctional officer. I didn't know about the Weird Darkness podcast when I was dealing with my postpartum. However, due to my past medical history and my two jobs that almost guarantee me to have some type of mental illness in the future, I am glad that there is a soft place to fall other than the usual government-funded sites." Chantel is right. The organizations that we're raising funds for this month, Seven Cups, iFred, and the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline are all funded by donors like you and me who understand the importance of these resources being available. You can make a donation now of any amount by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash overcoming. Or click the link in the show notes.
My true story took place in Fresno, California. I lived with my family, brothers and sister, mother and father, in a little trailer home in my grandma's big, creepy backyard with a run-down dirt ditch. At night, we sometimes heard a woman's cries coming from the ditch, but that's a different story. There were so many creepy, scary moments in that place, but this story is about my father and mother. My father used to lock us in the trailer when he went to get drunk. When he came back late one night, he was unusually quiet, with a blank look on his face. He just walked by us all laying on the ground and on the couch and went straight to the back room where my mom was laying nervously on the bed. He laid down with his back facing her and she asked, are you okay? He started to quietly laugh, his voice raspy as if his throat was filled with mucus. He then said, my friend wants to come in. Scared, my mom asked what friend he was talking about. Quietly, my dad said, he's waiting outside our bedroom door. My mom looked toward the bedroom door that was slightly open and saw two yellowish-red eyes peering in at her. She got so scared she yelled, no, and then began to pray. She heard my father say, he can't help you, I already have all of your children. When he said that, the smell of death filled the room. Crying, she said, you'll never have them. She knew she wasn't talking to my father, but rather something evil inside him. He slowly rolled over to face her, and she stared at him, not knowing what would happen next. When my father finally faced her, his eyes and face were so demented, it looked as if there was a demon's face over his own. It just stared and smiled at her with an evil, twisted look. My mom ran out of the room to be with us, but nothing else happened. My father says he remembers nothing of that night. He doesn't even remember how he got home. I just want to say that I've never been a believer in the supernatural. I think that everything has a logical explanation. There's absolutely no explanation, though, for what I'm about to share with you, and I just can't stop thinking about it. Last October, I was in London visiting my brother who lives in Hammersmith. I booked into my hotel late, around 11 p.m., and had planned on eating at the hotel restaurant, but it had closed. I decided to find a local restaurant that was still serving food. I found one nearby that was still open. The restaurant was empty, except for the manageress and me. She was very pleasant and talked a lot. She was telling me about the local tourist attractions and places to check out while I was in London, and she seemed amazingly astute. In fact, she seemed almost psychic, even guessing my age, almost to the day and even certain things that I was actually planning to do the next day. At closing time, she went out to the back of the restaurant, I guess, to put some cash in the safe or something. As I was sitting there, I was wondering what time I wanted to get up and go see my brother the next day. I finished my drink that I'd already paid for, but I decided to wait until the manageress came back so she could lock up behind me. After five minutes, she still had not come back, so I got up and knocked on the door at the back of the restaurant where she had gone earlier. I opened the door to find the room in darkness. As my eyes adjusted to the dark, I saw the woman who I had just finished talking to standing, facing me, staring straight back at me from the rear of the room. Her skin was a clammy, cracked olive color, and her eyes were just black, I mean no white at all. Her eyes and mouth were open really wide and she started screaming the most spine-chilling sounds, something I couldn't understand. It sounded like a foreign language, something like Latin. I screamed with fright. Her clothes now looked all old and she moved too fast. The room must have been at least 15 feet deep. She then started darting from the front to the back of the room, still facing me, and from side to side, at an impossible speed. She wasn't running, just moving. 
I started to back away from the door, and then she ran straight at me. I turned and ran out of the restaurant, jumped in my car. As I started the car, I could see her nightmarish face in the restaurant windows, darting, it seemed, to every window at an impossible speed. I tore out of the parking lot as fast as I could. I looked in my rearview mirror and nearly jumped out of my skin to see that she was sitting in the back seat of my car, still with that nightmarish expression. I swerved the car down the street in sheer panic. She let out an ear-piercing scream and then just vanished. She was there for long enough to know I didn't imagine it. I don't know what that was that spoke to me in the restaurant that day, but I know it wasn't a prank. I swear, at night, sometimes I think I see her shadow moving in the dark in my room, just staring at me. I haven't slept properly since, or been back to that restaurant. West Yarmouth, Massachusetts, June 1st, 2015, approximately 2.30 in the morning. I was sitting up in my bed after a girlfriend of mine had just left. The next thing I knew, a bright blue light was shining through my slider, and I was laying flat on my back, completely paralyzed. I think I could move my eyes, but I'm not sure. Then there were three four to five foot tall beings at the end of my bed, Their faces seemed kind of blurry, or maybe it's my memory of it. The one in the middle was talking to me in my own voice, but inside of my head. I was trying to scream or even just move, but I couldn't. I just remember him telling me that everything was going to be fine, they're not going to hurt me. I asked them what they wanted. They said they just had to run a few tests, and in the blink of an eye, the other two beings were on both sides of me. The two of them put their two fingers underneath my lower back and my shoulder, and I was lifted out of the bed as if weightless. Then they floated me towards the sliding door, and the flash of blue light took me out. After that, all I remember was a cold table and feeling very uncomfortable. And then I was back in my bed, sitting up, and it was 4.30 in the morning. I have a strange circle scar on my arm and three small scars in the shape of a triangle on the head of my genital. Since then, I have seen a bright orange fireball floating across the sky in my backyard, and I wake every night at 3.30 and can watch the clock change. If this is just a dream, it was the most traumatic dream I've ever had in my life, and I hope my kids don't have these dreams dreams that result with scars. I lived in Illinois in a town called New Baden. I lived in a trailer that had a demon living inside my four-year-old daughter's closet. I closed her closet door every night, but the left side of the sliding doors would always be open in the morning. I said, if you're afraid of the bad man who lives in your closet, why do you keep opening the door? She said, Mommy, I don't. He does. When I asked what he looked like, she said, He was naked and fat and red all over, and that his eyes looked funny. I drew several pictures of eyes, human eyes, cat eyes, and even a goat's eyes with the rectangular pupil. When she saw the goat eyes, my daughter got all excited and said, those look like his eyes. My blood ran cold. Everyone said I was crazy to believe my four-year-old, but the weirdest things happened all the time. I once saw a knick-knack on my shelf float out to the middle of the living room. When I said, hey, don't touch my stuff, it fell to the floor. I left it there. I didn't want to touch it. 
I went to the bathroom, and when I came back, the knickknack was back on the shelf. Freaking out, I took my daughter to her grandmother's house to tell her grandmother what was going on in the trailer. Her grandmother was a child psychologist, and I thought she could tell if my daughter was lying and what I could do. I left the two of them alone, and about five minutes later, her grandmother brought me to the room and gave me two pictures from church that had been blessed. Hang these in her room, she said. They might help. So I did. The next morning, my daughter said Jesus had come out of the picture and told the bad man to leave and never come back. She said the bad man cried like a little girl and was so scared he peed himself. Jesus then told her to go to sleep, that she was safe now. I knew something bad had been in the house with us as I always felt so sad when I lived there. After Jesus banished the bad thing, my house felt so nice and I wasn't sad anymore. I tried to learn about the trailer's history, like if there'd been a death or something, but it was purchased as a repo and back then they didn't tell people if somebody died inside a home. I knew for sure the bad thing was gone when my dog had a litter of puppies in that closet. Before, she refused to go in the closet and bit me when I tried to put her inside. Up next, what's the deal with Friday the 13th? When did it begin? Is there anything to it? Is there anything we can do about it? Why does Friday the 13th scare us so much? We'll talk about it when Weird Darkness returns. You can hear the snarls right behind you. The faster you run, the closer the creatures seem to get. How can the undead run this fast, you think to yourself? Now you're drenched in sweat, but your mouth is dry. You need to find somewhere to stop and think about how to survive the next few minutes of your life. Then you see it and run towards the water station. The zombie fun run will have to wait until you quench your thirst. But bottled water is expensive, and you don't even want to know what might be in tap water or much less fresh water. Fortunately, the horde of horror fanatics at this water station planned in advance and brought Patriot Pure Outdoor Filtration Water Cooler System. It gives you clean, cold water wherever you go. Its five-gallon tank keeps water cold, keeps ice for days on end, reduces the levels of over 200 contaminants with a two-step filtration technology which you can use with tap water, well water, river water, or any water source you find. It's UV resistant, so it works just as well at any time of day. And you're avoiding the cost of bottled water while also avoiding the unnecessary use of plastic, all in one system. It might be the only non-terrifying thing at your Halloween or fall-themed activity. Get the Patriot Pure Outdoor Filtration Water Cooler System at 4Patriots.com. That's the number 4Patriots.com. And use the promo code WEIRD to get 10% off everything you order. That's 4Patriots.com, promo code WEIRD. Uh-oh, zombies are back. It's Friday the 13th, which comes immediately after Thursday the 12th, which nobody seems to have an issue with. Nor do they have an issue with Saturday the 14th, but Friday the 13th. Why all the anxiety? In short, because the fear is ingrained in Western culture, according to experts. If nobody bothered to teach us about these negative taboo superstitions like Friday the 13th, we might in fact all be better off says Stuart Weiss, a professor of psychology at Connecticut College in New London. People who harbor a Friday the 13th superstition might have tristatacophobia – it's a fear of Friday the 13th – and often pass on that belief to their children. Popular culture's obsession with the fear – think Friday the 13th horror films or even this podcast as I'm talking to you – helps keep it alive. 
Although superstitions can be arbitrary, a fear of ladders or black cats, for example, once they are in the culture, we tend to honor them," said Thomas Gilovich, a professor of psychology at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. You feel like if you're going to ignore it, you're tempting fate," he explained. The trepidation surrounding Friday the 13th is rooted in religious beliefs surrounding the 13th guest at the Last Supper, Judas, the apostle said to have betrayed Jesus and the crucifixion of Jesus on a Friday, which was known as Hangman's Day and was already a source of anxiety, Vice said. The two fears merged, resulting in this sort of double whammy of 13 falling on an already nervous day, he said. More interesting, he noted, is why people associate any Friday the 13th with bad luck. The answer, he said, has to do with what he calls principles of magical thinking found in cultures around the world. One of these principles involves things or actions if they resemble other things in any way of resemblance, shape or sound or odor or color. People tend to think those things are related, he explained. In this framework, there were 13 people present at the Last Supper, so anything connected to the number 13 from then on is bad luck. As for Friday, it's well known among Christians as the day Jesus was crucified. Also, some biblical scholars believe Eve tempted Adam with the forbidden fruit on a Friday. Perhaps most significant is a belief that Abel was slain by his brother Cain on Friday the 13th. Meanwhile, in ancient Rome, witches reportedly gathered in groups of twelve. The 13th was believed to be the devil. In modern times, many Triskaidekaphobes point to the ill-fated mission to the moon, Apollo 13. Thomas Fernsler, an associate policy scientist in the Mathematics and Science Education Resource Center at the University of Delaware in Newark, said the number 13 suffers because of its position after the number 12. According to Fernsler, numerologists consider the number 12 a complete number. There are 12 months in a year, 12 signs of the Zodiac, 12 gods of Olympus, 12 labors of Hercules, 12 tribes of Israel, and 12 apostles of Jesus, he pointed out. 13's association with bad luck, he said, has to do with just being a little beyond completeness. The number becomes restless or squirmy, not unlike some folks with Triskaidekaphobia today. This fear of the number 13 can be seen even in how societies are built. More than 80% of high-rise buildings lack a 13th floor, for example, and many airports skip the 13th gate. Hospitals and hotels regularly have no room number 13. On streets in Florence, Italy, the house between number 12 and number 14 is addressed as 12 and a half. In France, socialites known as the Quadzorians or 14ers once made themselves available as 14th guests to keep a dinner party from an unlucky fate. On Friday the 13th, some people are so crippled by fear that they lock themselves inside. Others will have no choice but to grit their teeth and nervously muster through the day. Nevertheless, many people will refuse to fly, refuse to buy a house or act on a hot stock tip, in actions that noticeably slow economic activity, according to Donald Dossey, a folklore historian and founder of the Stress Management Center and Phobia Institute in Asheville, North Carolina. It's been estimated that in the U.S., $800 or $900 million is lost in business on this day because people will not fly or do business as they normally would, he said. To overcome the fear, Vice said people should take small steps outside their comfort zone. Those who are afraid to leave the house should consider meeting a close friend at a cozy cafe, for example. Try some small thing that they would be reluctant to do under normal circumstances and gradually experience, hopefully, no horrible thing happen when they push through and carry on. Unfortunately, our society has many odd superstitions. One athlete refuses to eat anything but chicken on game day. 
others are concerned about lucky numbers, avoiding stepping on certain lines on the field or having the same seat on the bench all the time. But one thing we should not suffer from is a fear of Friday the 13th, because superstitions should not have any hold or power over us. It's God that has the power over us. He is truly all-powerful. Nothing we do or believe can change that. And that includes luck, bad or good. We need to be devoted to an all-powerful God, not an all-powerless superstition. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise. Sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Screaming Waitress was posted at ghost-story.co.uk. The Bad Man in the Closet was written by an unknown author. They Came Into My Bedroom was posted at Phantoms and Monsters. 15 Corning Street was written by Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. Daddy Demon is by an unknown author. And my sources for Friday the 13th stories came from National Geographic. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marler House Productions. Copyright 2023. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. 1 Timothy 4 verse 7 Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. And a final thought, Friday the 13th is still better than Monday the whatever. But still, today you might want to avoid remote cabins and anyone named Jason. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Hey Weirdos! Be sure to click the like button and subscribe to this channel and click the notification bell so you don't miss future videos. I post videos seven days a week. And while you're at it, spread the darkness by sharing this video with someone you know who loves all things strange and macabre. If you want to listen to the podcast, you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash listen.